CityCast from Explicity. Hens, home you idle creatures, get you home. Is this a holiday? What? No, you not. Being mechanical, you ought not walk upon a labouring day without the sign of your profession. Speak, what trade art thou? Why, sir, a carpenter? Where is thy leather apron and thy rule? What dost thou with thy best apparel on? You, sir, what trade are you? Truly, sir, in respect of a fine workman I am, but as you would say, a cobbler. But what trade art thou? Answer me directly. A trade, sir, that I hope I may use with a safe conscience, which is indeed, sir, a mender of bad souls. What trade, thou knave, thou naughty knave, what trade? Nay, I beseech you, sir, be not out with me. Yet if you be out, sir, I can mend you. What meanest thou by that? Mend me, thou saucy fellow? Why, sir, cobble you? Thou art a cobbler, art thou? Truly, sir, all that I live by is with thee all. I meddle with no tradesmen's matters, nor women's matters, but with all. I am indeed, sir, surgeon to old shoes. Most, if not all of us, who studied English in school will immediately recognize that passage. Those are the opening lines from Julius Caesar by Shakespeare. Old J.C. was in the curriculum, wasn't he? While I was lucky to have had an English literature teacher who was all about the romance of prose and poetry and, of course, Shakespeare, I am ever surprised when I meet those who studied literature mechanically only to pass an exam. Anyway, that passage is a favorite of my guest today, journalist and author Amrita Shah. She says she picked that one to read for its humor, especially the cobbler double entendre. When I was in my late twenties, I was burning to write for a national publication. My target was, let's call it the gentleman's magazine, Debonair. Debonair was India's playboy. You read it for the articles. No, seriously, you did. Debonair, by design, had some of the most literary writing in the country. I figured that if I was published by Debonair, it would improve my street cred. And it did. And I had a column there for a few months until they went and sold it to some guy who wanted to have nothing to do with literature, just more nudes, or so I've been told. But what could have been more woke back then? than the fact that Debonair had a woman as an editor, and that was Amrita Shah. I wrote goofy sexual humor pieces for her that I thought were witty. Happily, so did she, I'm assuming, because we're still friends. Among other things, Amrita Shah is known for her groundbreaking investigative pieces on the Bombay underworld. She interviewed the infamous Don Bharadarajan Mudaliar, about whom the movie Nayakan was made, in an exclusive cover story scoop for the Illustrated Weekly of India. And in her noteworthy career, she has authored three books to considerable acclaim. You can read the podcast description for a bio of Amrita. But for now, I'm eager to get on with my conversation with her and let her talk on <laughs> what makes her tick. Amrita Shah. It is both an honor and a privilege to be able to welcome you to my podcast, The Literary City. Thank you, Ramji. It's a pleasure to be here. I've read you as an intrepid reporter, investigative pieces, and then the magazine phase of your career, to which I contributed a little. Absolutely. And now you've moved on to the weighty, <laughs> researching and writing books that have been admired by the Illuminati. Oh, I like that word, Illuminati. I think though it has a not so great meaning but but yeah no, I, I know I was appealing to that wacky sense of humor that I know of <laughs> okay my opening salvo why do you write it's sort of a very natural thing for me to do from a very young age I recall being able to write I know that I was going to write uh, but I think that um, it, it may have had something to do with the fact that my mother named me. She was thinking about Amrita Shergil and Amrita Pritam. And I did, as, as a kid, want to be both an artist and a writer. And then I kind of chose to write. Um, also, I had, a, you know, I had a father who was very interested in literature. There were always books in the house. What kind of books? What kind of books? Well, uh, both my parents went to Gujarati schools and I think they learned English kind of on the side. So 
The kind of library that my father had was full of the classics, good literature, supposed to be read. Why did magazine writing, like feature writing, appeal to you more than news reportage? I wanted to write well. I also wanted to look at larger, the larger picture, to make connections, to, to, to give voice to the sort of subtle and complex things that go on. You know, a serious magazine writing allows you to do. Right. For example, your famous pieces on the Bombay underworld. Right. What led you to that story? That must have been fun. I mean, you were the queen of the underworld, weren't you? <laughs> well, yes, I would happily kind of assume that. Well, it happened in a very wacky way. It started out because I was a trainee and I was told you're not going to write for six months. I mean, you know, don't expect to get a byline. And so I was a sort of dog's body as a trainee. And then there was a murder in a courtroom in Mumbai in 83. And, um, and I was very excited, you know, because I saw the potential. I knew what it meant. It wasn't just a, it was a murder in a courtroom, which by itself was quite stunning. But there was also some sort of gang war going on behind it, which I had some, some inkling of because, you know, you read the tabloids and you get all this masala. And, stuff. Mm-hmm. and so I suggested, you know, to my editor, who was quite a fun, you know, he was very open to good ideas and stuff. And I said, you know, we should do a story. Not think, not I will do a story. We should do a story. Right. But everyone said, oh, no, you know, like crime. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and How fortuitous. Yes. And, you know, I really was allowed to do it. I mean, allowed in the sense, okay, she's a kid, you know, let her, let her try. And it just took off. It just, it just became so popular that I went on to do many stories. As I got deeper and deeper into it, I met a lot of criminals. I started looking at uh, processes a lot. Uh, or the kinds of crimes, smuggling. And um, and I started realizing that it's not, you call it the underworld, but it's actually part of society. It's a demand and supply situation. So, you know, so, so some people are ready to supply what is illegal in the overworld uh, or, or whatever we, we think we live in. Um, but it's actually connected because so some people go off and shoot and, you know, do the illegal things, but then they will supply the gold smuggled to jewelers who are sitting in proper shops in proper markets and we will, you know, buy. So I guess I had a, a kind of appreciation of the world as a more rounded uh, place where crime was very much a part of it. Part of what? Is it human nature or economics? Economics. Human nature, I mean, of course, crime is a part of human nature, but that's not exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying the society we have chosen to to build and live in um, has a place for crime, which we don't take responsibility for it. People who made mafia shows like The Godfather and The Sopranos had stories about how they came in contact with the mafia. What was meeting Bhadraj and Mudalia like? Yeah, it was, I, it was, it was not, not pleasant. I mean... <laughs> You know, you they, because the thrill, and I was very, very young, and the thrill of a story and the thrill of getting more information, etc., just drives you along. My editor said, "Oh, you know, we need to, we need to get him," and I was so young that I actually took that very seriously, and I landed up at his doorstep, and they they first slammed the door in my face, and then they called me, <laughs> and I went and I got this long interview with him with a photo shoot. We put him on the cover. I sat and had coffee with him on the floor. Of course, he didn't kind of answer many of it. Was, but, you know, it, the, in the moment, it's very thrilling. But it is not pleasant. You know that, you know, through all this, you know that you're talking to people who are, who, um, I mean, I don't know if you see The Sopranos and you know, you know, that there's a certain um, level of, um, well, most of us, you know, law-respecting, law-abiding people will not do certain things which these people will do. And so it is, it is frightening. And I was, always, I was always scared. Understandably. But did the excitement part of the job lead you to romanticize crime? Never. Because, I mean, never. I, never, I know that that question has, um, I know that it's an ethical dilemma in journalism, but I never tried to whitewash anything but I did have a concern that that style of writing that narrative you know full of texture can romanticize I did feel concerned you still have a job to do don't you 
One of your heroes, Joan Didion, in that documentary that's on Netflix, she when asked about how she felt about finding a five-year-old child in a drug den, frothing at the mouth with white lips because it had been given hard drugs, said in response, pure gold. <laughs> well, I'm laughing, but you know, there, it, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a kind of dilemma that you have to take a sort of stand on. I mean, I, I know photographers will... Will you shoot or will you help? A dilemma that's not going to get resolved anytime soon. So moving on, who would you say are the literary journalists that inspired you? My favorite, uh, you know, literary journalists are um, Gay Talizi is a big favorite of mine. Um, Tom Wolfe, I, I like a great deal. Uh, Joan Didion, of course. Truman Capote, John Fowles, um, names of the past, I think. Maybe, but they're yeah. still role models for us. They prevail. Why do you? Why do you suppose? The idea that something should be crafted, the idea of there should be wisdom in writing. I am. I'm perpetually zapped when you know everyone is this great writer in their twenties, and you might even be good at writing. But where is the understanding or of life? Uh, what experience do you bring to it? But I. I don't know. I'm. I'm always puzzled because when I grew up, the whole idea of writing was that you, you know a lot. Um, and you bring that to your writing. Well, it zaps me too to hear of someone whose first book is a memoir of their writing life. Yeah. <laughs> and now for a topic you've been itching to get into, Debonair. <laughs> it was said that we read Debonair like Playboy for the articles, right? Yes. <laughs> well, I wrote for Debonair because of the articles. Right. And because of you, I'll say. But... It must have been some kind of a decision to work for Debonair magazine. Let me put some context to this. Uh, I became a journalist in the 80s when a feature writer, magazine writer, and there was a bunch of magazines at the time which all shut down, possibly because of competition from television, but uh, various things were happening that uh, seemed to just snuff out the life of magazines. And ideologically, newspapers were sort of becoming either extremely commercial and marketing-oriented, or they were becoming, they were taking political stances, which um, I, you know, I was not comfortable with. Suddenly, I felt like I had no place in journalism. And th this debonair offer came at that point. And I, but I always loved debonair. Uh, you know, it was one of the magazines that um, we read. It had very good writing. And we looked at the photographs. I'm not going to try and say that, you know. The semi-nude photographs were something separate or it was part of the package. And I remember one day I was uh, try taking Debonair home. You know, I opened it and I looked at the center spread and suddenly I realized I'm in a train in a lady's compartment and I had to quickly fold it up. You know, because <laughs> Those are very exciting times in terms of design and new writing. But it still would have to have been a fairly considered decision. I actually very seriously thought about what I was uh, taking on, mm -hmm. what it was doing was objectifying women. And I don't, uh, I, I say that when I became editor, I was um, being part of that um, assumption. And I, I was. Right. Uh, but I kind of also weighed it against everything. Life just is not perfect. The choices you are given are not straightforward. There was no pretense. It was not hiding. Um, there's a book by Naomi Wolf, for instance, on women's magazines and how much they sell to make a woman kind of deprive a woman of her self-esteem, which then makes you buy products, et cetera, et cetera. Covert stuff that happens. And I felt here that this was not covert. It was very overt. I'd say, but friends of mine who, whose opinions would have been relevant in a case like this didn't seem to have a problem with you being the editor of Debonair. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Still, you would have looked to bring something new to the table. Right, yeah. And, and so then what I actually did as editor was to to kind of beef up a bit of the... Wait a second. Is is there a pun in that? Beef up? <laughs> no. Did you go and put dudes in the magazine? <laughs> well, I, I did. I put a... I put a, a for the first time, we started putting a, a, a man... Why? Did it make you feel better? So we, we did... Ex I'm not trying to excuse or apologize or anything like that. I think that there are people who would, who would take offense at... A, a woman running a magazine like that. And I, I, with all, you know, respect, I said they, they have a point. I think most people felt that Debenham was a great magazine and that you did a great job. 
and reading that, it goes to your disillusionment with journalism, doesn't it? I think the idea itself of what journalism was and what role it played in society has disappeared. The media itself has been redefined. It's just no longer uh, the fourth estate. It's not meant to be that. It's now meant to be a PR machine. So it doesn't matter how honest you yourself are. Have we lost the battle? It, we had to fight for the role of journalism, which was not done. Right. So now what we're fighting about is what one channel might say or what someone might say. That's not the point. Uh, you, you've kind of pulled the rug from under everyone's feet. So, it, you know, it just doesn't matter what people do anymore. By definition, doesn't factual writing and research address objectivity? Yes, but you know, when I when uh, those magazines I was talking about were there in the 80s, they were quite central to the conversation. Today, you can write a very good piece and it's sort of might get a little play on social media, but it won't actually affect anything. It's important because it makes people think, but it's not what needs to change. I think now it, it, it's over. It's almost like this phase of the media is over. And Unless we recognize the need for it and, you know, put in the safeguards, um, start, it's almost like we'll have to start it all over again in a different way. So will good, honest writing ever come back into fashion, you think? Well, I think we're going through this sort of um, a period when everything is being so-called democratized, you know, where you're kind of making everything popular. And, and then I think then at some point someone is going to say, oh, now we really like good writing. And then there's going to be a little time where, you know... Well, new order, old order, new writing, old writing. Which way do you tilt? The, okay, so the kind of good writers or classics that one grew up reading, there's been a lot of rethinking on that. There's a whole lot of patriarchy that was uh, pushed by what is now called dead white male writers. <laughs> yes. Which is being questioned. I'm not completely against even this sort of shake-up. It's fine. There are a lot of things that are thrown up. I think a lot of new voices can kind of challenge the the whole structure of privilege where you then bring in new voices people from other countries third world countries i think people who are economically and socially deprived who now have a voice but so we get good vigorous new language i think what i'm against is this really crass marketing the the thing that anything can sell with marketing i, I can't stand that i hear you the ecosystem that can provide good literature mm. doesn't have to be defined by high language. Mm. Simple declarative sentences will do the trick. Right. But there has to be the environment. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that what maybe this podcast itself that you're doing, the, talking about writing and talking about books and ideas without that kind of space for a critique um, is very, very, you know, sadly sort of missing here. Uh, we don't have we have hype and we have, um, you know, the kind of slanging match that goes on um, on Twitter and stuff. We don't we don't have people respectfully looking at at ideas, even if they disagree with them or, or good writing or bad writing. And Thank you for that comment about the podcast. I will bask in that compliment. That's good. <laughs> and as a wise man once ought to have said, quit while you're ahead. <laughs> but before we go, I have a bone to pick with you. Okay. May I? Yes, of course. It was a few years ago. You were the editor right. of Elle magazine. Uh -huh. And you called me and asked me if I would write a fluff piece for you about gossip. Did I? Okay. And, and ever your humble servant, I rose to the task, didn't I? Uh -huh. And I thought I wrote an absolutely brilliant piece. Uh -huh. And in my fascinating effort at high literature, I had written an absolutely gobsmackingly brilliant last line. Uh -huh. The piece was about gossip, love and sex, right? So my last line went like this. After all, it's love that makes the word go around. <laughs> and do you want to know what one of your subs did to that last line? They cut it? Worse, they changed word to world. <gasps> oh, no. No. Yes, unfortunately. I mean, I would, I would know what you meant. That's a, oh, my God. That is... A, that is um, that is a bone to pick. <laughs> and I have to apologize. <laughs> oh, no, no, you don't have to apologize. No. <laughs> See, I was just trying to get the last word in. You had the last word anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the last word in. That's clever. A pleasure having you on the Literary City, Amrita. Thank you for gracing us. And let's do it again. Thank you, Ramji. It was a pleasure. And of course, yes, look forward. 
Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. All right. And it's time now for that magic segment, What's That Word?, where we delve into the etymology of words and phrases that we hear and use every day, but never stop to think about. And to help me with it is my co-host, she of the crazy ability with letters of the English language. I'll let her introduce herself. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Pranithi. But since I'm master of letters, you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. P. All right, P with an A. What's the word? Well, today, before we get into our regular what's that word, uh -huh. we have a caller on the line. We do. What's he selling? <laughs> He'd like to discuss the etymology of a word. Huh. Well, is he on the line? I'm calling him now. Okay. And here he is, Ramji, on the phone, all the way from the United States, we have Shashwat Sirsi. Shashwat, hi, welcome to the Literary City. Hi, Shashwat. What's the short form? Uh, you can call me Shash. Hey, Shash. Where in the States are you calling from? Uh, I'm calling you from San Marcos, Texas. How's things in Texas? You expecting another snowstorm like last year? Power problems and so on? They're expecting the snowstorm, or rather, they're expecting like a cold snap to come in. Uh, hopefully, the power grid will hold up this time. Last time, it took us unawares, and we had power for like half an hour in the morning and half an hour in the evening, during which time you had to like finish cooking. And I, uh, as usual, had a a minimal amount of planning going into the winter storm. So it was like a gross episode of Top Chef every morning. Like you have pineapples, hot dogs, and ketchup, and 30 minutes to make something. Or as any teenage boy would say, gourmet food. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Shash, you had a word that you wanted to check with us today. Yeah, I, I was uh, just interested to, you know, like discuss the etymology of the word Lou. Lou, L-O-O, Lou. Lou, yes, you know, okay. which refers to the toilet. It's pretty uh, ubiquitous in, in, you know, everyday conversation. And I was just wondering if, if you all were interested in discussing, like, the, the origin of the word. Oh, totally, totally. That's what we do. But you use the word ubiquitous. Now, you don't ubiquitously use the word Lou in Texas, do you? Uh, no, no, we do not. In fact, the first time I said to my boss that I was going to use the loo he was like we don't use that word around here we're not english we're american so. <laughs> way to stick it to the colonial masters <laughs> okay so loo well as with many words and phrases no agreement on the etymology but many interesting stories shash you go first like you said there are several theories that that you know have been spun about right. to provide an origin to the word but <clears throat> i think the most common one is is Garde loup, uh, which which basically is French for watch out for the water. Right. And uh, basically in, in medieval times, they used to do their business in a chamber pot. And right. then once the chamber pot was full, they would throw it out the window. Right. And Ugh. while they're throwing it out the window, they would yell, watch out for the water. Garde loup. Golfers are less sophisticated, aren't they? All they can do is to yell for. <laughs> One of the ways that etymologists try to establish the root of a use of a phrase or a word is to go back and find its earliest occurrence. For Lou, the earliest that they have been able to find is fairly recent, in fact. James Joyce's Ulysses in 1922. He had a pun on the word Waterloo, and the quote was, Oh yes, mon loup, how much cost? Waterloo, what a closet. Now, obviously, it was the Lou out of Waterloo, the famous battle, and water, loo, bathroom, right? There's another one. Uh, again, I, and I don't think this is very popular. It refers to sailors having to pee off the leeward side of the ship where the wind is not blowing. Right. And so leeward kind of like morphed into leeward. Ah. And that's from where they say that also it's possible that loo came about. 
and also the expressions pissing in the wind or spitting in the wind. Wow, that's new information. I hadn't heard this one before. Thank you for that. And finally, I have this rather wacky theory that Lou actually comes from Lady Louisa. Now, Lady Louisa was the unpopular wife of uh, the Earl of Lichfield, and it is said that in 1867, she and the Earl were staying at a friend's house, and a couple of young wise guys took her name card off the bedroom door and stuck it on the bathroom. <laughs> and then after that, all the guests started to talk about going to Lady Louisa. Ah, that's mean. That's a mean prank. But all said and done, the theory that holds the most water <laughs> is from the French expression, lieu d'essence, which meant restroom. Now, uh, lieu in uh, f French means place, and it's just a polite way of referring to the bathroom. So the, the lieu d'essence restroom becoming lou in English is the most likely theory. But you know what? I like Shash's explanation the best, and I'm going to stick with it. Garder l'eau is fascinating. All right, that's a wrap for this segment. And Shash, thanks so much for being here. And you know what? We look forward to having you uh, back on the show. And if you ever find something that deserves discussion, give us a shout. Okay. Yeah, I'll keep a lookout. And in the meanwhile, you stay safe and dry and watch out for that winter. I don't know. I've stocked up on groceries. And uh, if it snows, then I'm just going to use snow melt. <laughs> Maybe you could go to Mexico also. Ooh, like our senator. Yeah. it's <laughs> a good idea. <laughs> okay, Shaj. Nice having you on the show. Catch you again soon. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Hope to see you soon again. Bye. Are they loo, guys? Well, that was fun. Shash, a fellow word geek from Texas. We should have him on the show more often, don't you think? Yeah, we must. I'll talk to him. Okay, cool. All right, P with an A. What's the word today? Yeah, this one's quite obvious. You know, the opening lines of Julius Caesar that Amrita Shah picked. Huh? She said she picked it because she liked the banter and the play on the word cobbler. Yes, she did. Well, aren't we all punsters? <laughs> it must have been so hard for you to resist saying pundits. Ooh, derision. Derision becomes you this evening, doesn't it? <laughs> So cobbler, mm -hmm. I was traveling once and I had an American peach cobbler. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. But I know that banter had to do with cobbler of shoes and soles spelt both ways. Yes, that was the sum and substance of uh, the opening scene from Julius Caesar. You're right. Yeah. So let's get to the origins of cobbler. Okay. So you know the word cobblestones, don't you? That's right. You know, a path or a track that is paved over with irregular, though smooth, stones to keep chariots and uh, wagons from getting stuck in a rut. Right. So the business of laying down those stones for the road was considered fairly an unskilled job. So even today, we use the term to cobble something together, which means that you don't bring too much finesse to the job. So anyone who did a rough and unskilled job was a cobbler. Ah. Maybe the same guys who did that cobblestone road work also took to mending shoes. Right. I mean, just think, take Casca on his way to perforating Caesar he has this little cobblestone that goes through the hole in his shoe and gets lodged in that and he has to hop on one foot in pain. <laughs> he needs a cobbler to fix things. Now, you mentioned peach cobbler. That's a, a deep dish pie with a thick crust, right? Yum. Well, when you pull one of these cobblers out of the oven, the top crust looks like full of lumpy dough and that looks like a cobblestone, right? So... That's apparently why they're called cobblers. Huh, I like that. Okay, moving forth from gluttony, do you want to hear a funny story about a cobbler? Yeah. This one is a real takedown of a cobbler. Okay. So in the late 14th century, mm -hmm. there was this Greek painter called Apelles. For real, that's his name. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you can Apelles me, Apelles. <laughs> So Apelles had this painting exhibition and a cobbler stopped by, looked at the painting and remarked to his friend that a shoe had been wrongly painted. Now, Apelles overheard this. He was in the habit of hiding close by and listening to everyone. 
maybe from behind a pillar. Yeah, it's it's the equivalent of lurking in the comment section. Yeah, a real ego surfer or a palace. <laughs> so a palace corrected the shoe and he put it back up and the cobbler stopped by again and he saw the shoe had been corrected. Now, duly emboldened by the success of his criticism, the cobbler began to express his opinion pretty freely about the whole painting. And this was too much for the patience of the artist who rushed from his hiding place and told the cobbler to stick to shoes. <laughs> okay, P with an A, that brings us to the end of this wonderful segment again. As always, let's do it next week. Bye-bye. Now, if you come across a word or a phrase that intrigues you, confounds you, or merely piques your curiosity, share it with us and we would love to discuss it with you live on the air. Write to us the literary city at explosity.com or simply TLC at explosity.com or go to our Facebook page, Bangalore Literary Society or go to Instagram, Explosity BLR. You know what to do. If your question is interesting, we will call you. In the last few episodes, we put out a request for people to donate to the Association for People with Disabilities and we are heartened to know that some people actually did. Well, we asked the rest of you to please do the same. Go to apd-india.org. They run a school for children. And this is your chance to give a child a chance of becoming a contributing member of society and maybe play this game with us one day. And that is our show for today. I'm Ramji Chandran. Thank you so much for listening. And until next Wednesday, I hope you have a ripping week. Bye now. <music>